we welcome a conversation that we have been having as therapists for years now. And uh, knowing that uh, our therapists are the ones who are typically uh, putting together the uh, emergency plans or just the everyday bus transportation plans. And we have been seeking guidance on how to uh, bring other voices to those tables, working with the actual drivers and um, the folks at the state level to uh, make sure that we are uh, considering everything. So we've got some good track record there, but really coming down to what is it that you all need to know. We had uh, the Sarah and Tim at a recent town hall, and we really wanted to invite you all back where we can record a session that can be in our archives, and you can all refer to Sarah and Tim. I'm going to stop talking now, uh, but just wanted to set the stage for you, and we're so glad for you to take us to the next level. Uh, thanks for having us, guys. Um, I have my screen shared. I think it's good if it's not someone like way frantically in the background. Um, hopefully everyone can see that. You are good uh, to go, Sarah. We're good? Yeah. All right, good. I, I think we might need to shrink it just a hair. Do you want me to shrink I don't it? think we're getting the bottom part of the slide. All right. But while she's shrinking that, I just want to put in a plug for Connie's presentation in a couple of weeks. I, I'm lucky enough to work with Connie in Fairfax County, and uh, she is fabulous and has presented in uh, a whole different uh, bunch of settings. And so it's good stuff. Please go. All right. Does that look better for you guys? Yep. Okay. So basically the first couple slides, we have session objectives that was listed on the website. We can probably roll through that. And this is just kind of to give you guys a viewpoint of what we're gonna be rolling through today. Um, we are here to present on transportation. I am a school-based physical therapist, obviously that has worked as transportation in the past. Tim um, is currently in Fairfax County Public Schools and is a transportation liaison. So um, when we have this conversation, a lot of the questions we get right off the bat are, do should PTs be trans uh, supporting transportation? And the place we like to start is reframing the school day. So if you guys want to quickly pull up the chat and just ask yourself, throw, we'll give like five seconds to throw in there. When for you guys or for your students, do you think the school day starts? If there's a specific time. We'll do like a five, <laughs> four, three, two, one. Yeah. Nice. Everybody's all right. So we're all on the same page, guys. This is great. Um, I, for the sake of the presentation today, we decided not to do it in presentation mode. So now you can't see my fabulous animation, but you're right. It stops at the bus. It starts at the bus stop. It stops, starts when our kids are getting on the bus. And there's a lot of evidence out there to support that. We know that um, the literature says that transportation can be impacting attendance it's also impacting inclusion. I wanted to highlight these two articles first. I don't know what our population or what our viewers are today. I'm a PT. So when I'm reading these things, I'm looking at it through the PT lens. And Gottfried Ozuno and Loy Hauser, when they looked at the attendance rates for kindergartners with high incidence diagnoses, so these are the kids being seen most frequently on the bus, staff is most familiar with. Uh, these are going to be our kids that are receiving services through speech language, de uh, developmental disabilities, and autism. They are actually seeing one day more increased in attendance compared to their non-bus riding general education peers, which is awesome. Our kids are in school. We're able to ac access them for services and see them. However, if you take attendance data for our kids and combine them with the high incidence diagnoses and the low incidence diagnoses, that improvement in attendance is gone. And so what does this mean for physical therapists through my PT lens I can give you a hint. And the low incidence diagnoses actually includes our kids that are receiving services through orthopedic impairment or other health impairment. So these are the kids that are bulk often of our caseloads, the kids that we are working with the most often, and perhaps the kids that we have an opportunity to educate staff on. If they are the low incidence diagnoses, the kids they're not seeing as often, the kids they're not as familiar with, this could be impacting their transportation experience, which could be negating that positive effect on attendance. So if we are working with these kiddos, we can support transportation to improve that experience to hopefully bump it up and get that similar improvement in attendance that we're seeing for high incidence diagnoses. For anyone on here that may not be a PT, what does this attendance mean? Well, if your kids are having a positive 
transportation experience and they are getting to school more often, that means you're able to see them. For inclusion, I wanted to highlight this article for Sorani and Villanueva because they looked at mobility, accessibility, and transportation, and they can be barriers to kids that are integrating to a general education program. Interest for mobility and accessibility and transportation, their solution was often to add an aid. Nowhere in this article does it say physical therapy or physical therapist. So they're identifying mobility and accessibility as a barrier, but we're not part of this conversation when we're talking about how to address this barrier. So we also know that uh, the school day for transportation is impacting self-determination. It's impacting socio-emotional well-being. It's impacting our students' participation in extracurricular activities. Transportation in and of itself is an access point for other services. So it could be off-site related services. It could be related services during transportation. So this particular article mentioned music therapy, occupational or orientation mobility. But what about physical therapy services? What about occupational therapy services? You're also getting our kids vocational programs, transition programs, extracurricular activities, field trips, community events. So transportation and getting our kids to these other services that are part of their educational program. Now, all of these authors looking at their data, they sum their take home points in a way that are just so much more direct than anything I could say today. So I do have quotes from their article and I added these highlights in the italics. These are my um, my additions. But for attendance, Gottfried, Azuna and Lloyd Hazard decided that what they're seeing means that the start and end of school day includes pickup and drop off times. And if we're shifting the perspective for school bus as mainly a people mover to an extension of the day to school experience, policy makers can use the school bus as a tool. And the school bus may also contain potential when considered as an invention. Looking at inclusion, basically, when you have kids that are having issues with transportation, they are falling behind academically, and that can also contribute to social problems. And if our kids are having issues with transportation, they're late to class, missing class, they have problems with their relationships with their peers, and they want to isolate themselves. And Buting and Card saw that for self-determination, safety in the school buses may translate to greater self-advocacy and dependence down the line. So if they're having positive transportation experiences in school, they can have positive transportation experiences in the future. And they're advocating for themselves. And looking at social emotional well-being, interestingly, Graham, Keyes, and McMahon were the only people that looked at transportation to and from school as well as within the school building, which we'll discuss uh, in the upcoming slides. But they said that routine review of travel experiences start as part of the IA experience as part of the IAP reviews can promote social emotional well-being. Inclusive social environments should apply within passing periods and during transportation to and from school. Problems with transportation may be detrimental to how students with disabilities are experiencing their school day. This underscores the value of conceptualizing the school day beyond the time spent in the school building. And the school day should include time spent in transit to and from school and within the school building. School buses and community routes to school serve as an extension of the school experience. So across the board, the data is out there telling us that transportation is part of the school day. We as school therapists support the educational program. We support the school day, so we can support transportation too. But then that leads us to the question of how? How are we doing that? What is out there to guide us? We're briefly going to go over federal regulations. I just have this slide in here to explain that often in our world, we talk about IDEA, and that's a law. Today, we are going to be referencing the Code of Federal Regulations. And the Code of Federal Regulations basically takes the explicit instructions that agencies that are responsible for carrying out the law have written up and published to guide people in carrying out the law. So when you're having conversations with other stakeholders, th these are the instructions and the guidelines that you can provide to them if they are confused about or misunderstanding what is federally mandated. And so that's why today you're going to see CFR, that's the Code of Federal Regulations. And to orient yourself when you're looking at the CFR, Title 34, Part 300, deals with IDEA Part B, and Title 34 Part 104 deals with Section 504. The upcoming slides is all information that you guys know, but I wanted to include these direct quotes in here so that you could use them as a starting point for conversations with others. So we know that um, transportation is a related service. We know that transportation includes to and from school, between schools, in the school and around the school building, as well as a specialized equipment to transport individuals or our students. Um, IDEA also includes transportation as a non-academic service, it includes transportation for kids that are federal, um, parentally placed. So these could be students in private schools. 
It describes or mandates documentation of related service. We know transportation is a related service. Transportation needs to be documented. It mandates documentation of transportation as a service plan for our parentally placed students. Uh, for 504, it includes transportation as a non-academic service requirement for FAPE. It also includes transportation to and from aid, benefit, or services required to meet FAPE. Interestingly, the federal regulations don't provide any information on how we should be documenting transportation services for our students receiving services through 504 plans. Now, these are the federal guidelines. Whenever we're talking about federal guidelines, we have to have the caveat in here about reminding you to go back and look at your state, local, district, sometimes even school-specific guidelines. And that refers to your either state PT Practice Act, your state educational policies, your district uh, educational policies, and even policies you may have within specific schools. Now, if you're looking at guidelines for the transportation world, there's a group called the National Congress of School Transportation, and they produce a document every five years, which as a PT, not a transportation professional, when I'm looking at it, it looks to me like the gold standard. And I say this because it's coming out of the National Congress of School Transportation. It, it, these, this is a group that's been around since 1939. They're still going. They meet every five years, except for 2020, for obvious reasons. And this Congress includes reps from state departments of ed, public safety, motor vehicles, police, any agency that's involved with statewide um, responsibilities for transporting students. And it is the steering committee for this Congress that is chaired by and its website, budget, and funding is managed by the National Association of State Directors of People Transportation. So when we have questions that get kicked up the chain higher and higher and higher, they go to the state directors of transportation, right? And these are the individuals that are involved in this group creating this document that we're going to go over now. The document is called the National School Transportation Specifications and Procedures. The Congress meets every five years. This comes out every five years. There were addenda put out in 2020 to the 2015 document. So we are citing the 2015 document. The addenda didn't really pertain to anything regarding um, transporting students with special needs. But the document we're going over today is 2015. There will be a new one coming out in 2025. And again, this document drives home exactly what we've talked about so far. Trans the school bus, it's an extension of the classroom. It's conducive to learning readiness. Um, Communication between all stakeholders is vital and transportation is a critical to the education process. When you're looking at the document, they have a guiding principle and it says any adaptation of these national specifications procedures should be made by states only in order to adjust to local needs. And they cannot conflict with any of the pre-existing federal guidelines that are out there. The intended use is for the document to be available for states to consider when establishing their standards, specifications, recommendations, and guidelines which is great. It's this document that's put together by all of these stakeholders that are like the top of the top, making, these are the decisions makers, right? And they're putting this out there for, to guide people. And then you get to the statement of understanding. I added the highlighting. I did not add the bold. But after all of that, it says the use of this publication in part or in its entirety is completely voluntary. So this is a great resource. It is still voluntary unless states decide to include it in part of their statewide regulations. The document itself is over 500 pages. These are sections that could be helpful for you guys. Uh, the specially equipped school bus specifications, very technical. We're talking measurements of aisle width, seat width, seat depth. So it's eight pages, you could look at it. It's not information that PTs should be responsible to know, but if you wanna know what transportation staff should be knowing, this is a place to start. There's a section on transportation for students with disabilities and special healthcare needs. This includes emergency evacuation of students with disabilities, section on infants, toddlers, preschool children, which includes transportation services for preschool children with disabilities. The appendix of school bus operations that includes emergency evacuation guidelines. It includes a crash report forms for wheelchair information. So when you're out there having conversations, we don't need to be recreating the wheel. These already exist. They've been put out there by the people that are heavily involved in this field. So if people are asking you, hey, we want you to create this, or what do you think about creating this? This is a place to direct them and guide them as to something that already exists. For the crash report forms and wheelchair information, what I think is helpful here, if you're creating educational documents for your district or your bus staff, you can go back and look at the terminology that the transportation industry is using so you can be a consistent in our communication. 
Appendix E is transportation for students with disabilities and special health care needs. This includes helpful forms. It also includes procedures for lifting passengers. It includes a step-by-step -step dependent one-person lift, dependent two-person lift, and even using an emergency blanket. So again, we don't need to recreate the wheel. And if you're getting specific questions from your transportation staff or anyone else in the district, it's a 500 page document. Use some keyword searches that might be helpful to get you to where you need to be. Um, so that is what I would consider the gold standard as far as what's out there for transportation guidelines in the transportation world. There are also voluntary US and international standards for wheelchairs and equipment transportation of wheelchairs. So we're, this is wheelchair specific, it is voluntary. We're gonna go over these standards in a little bit when we're going over resources. There are society position statements. So O'Neill and Hoffman, that's a position statement that came out from the American Academy of Pediatrics. It's included in resources. There are industry guidelines, like the document we just went over, as well as professional association resources. The APTA Pediatrics has a fact sheet, which we'll be going over. And there are also state policies. Overall, the data out there has lots of people, as you can see, are supporting that transportation staff should be formally trained, should include disability awareness training, stakeholders should collaborate, transportation plans should be documented in the IEP, transportation plans should include emergency evacuations. Now, if we are looking at Oregon specific transportation guidelines. Similar to the Code of Federal Regulations, you guys, Oregon, you guys have Oregon revised statutes. That's the law. The Oregon administrative rules are the word for word instructions and guidelines that we would be following. So we are quoting the OARs or the Oregon admin rules. You can find a list of the OARs related to public transportation or pupil transportation at this link. More specifically, we're going to be looking at Chapter 581, Division 3 accessible at this link. And these are school bus driver training, licensing, and school bus standards. In a groundbreaking statement, the Oregon Department of Education has found that as training increases, school bus accidents decrease. So basic training for a school bus driver includes eight hours of a core class, 15 hours behind the wheel training, and a first aid course. Now, in the OARs for the state, for the state of Oregon, they're, they define what a classroom instructor is, who's conducting this training, right? So this is a person who holds one or more of the following certificates. One of these certificates is the transporting students with special needs instructor certificate. If you don't have that instructor certificate, you're not conducting this training that the bus drivers need to safely transport students. So in the OARs, again, it says appropriate specialized training designed for special needs transportation shall be provided prior to allowing drivers to transport students with disabilities. What is the specialized training for special needs transportation? What does it look like? So through the OARs, briefly, it says it's an eight hour program that has five sections. And again, this is taught by an instructor that holds that certificate. If you wanna go and see what the curriculum is, go to this website, there's a manuals order form and for $15, you can get access to the training manual. That doesn't mean you're a certified instructor, but you can at least see the information that these bus drivers should be receiving prior to transporting our kids with special needs. So zooming out away from transportation to a general PT, we have our PT guide, we know and love the PT guide. It talks about our roles, it talks about evaluation, it talks about tests and measures. Interestingly, transportation is mentioned in several categories for tests and measures, specifically in the education life category. It says, um, for tests and measures that are gonna characterize or qualify the ability to gain access to school or other educational environments, an example of an appropriate tests and measure would be a transportation assessment. It's written in our guide to PT practice. We also talk about interventions. So we have education interventions, we have procedural interventions. Any of these educations that we're providing in the school building, adaptive assistive technology, functional training, motor function, movement training, therapeutic exercise, if we're doing it in the um, school building, can it be translated to transportation? If the answer is yes, then that's within our scope, according to the PT guide, right? Now, if we are looking at the Oregon State Practice Act, right? So we're not mandated to do anything according to the guide, but we need to look at our practice act. Again, you have the statutes, that's the law. We're going to be talking about the admin rules and specifically division four, because that's going to look at the minimum standards for physical therapy practice and records. The link is here. All of these links in the slides are also in the references. So you guys are ahead of the game. I'm from PT, I'm from PA. We don't have the word school anywhere written in our practice act. 
but you guys actually have the word school, which is awesome. Um, so functional training related to physical movement and mobility and work, it includes school. We know the school day includes transportation. So that's functional training related to physical movement and mobility and transportation. You have assistive, adaptive, orthotic, protective equipment. Anything that our kids are using in the school that they might need to use on transportation is within your practice act. And you even have standards for community education, prevention, health promotion, and wellness services. And that talks about non-individual education to de uh, for risk management and for body safety. So that's gonna be including any training you might be doing with individuals that isn't student specific, but maybe for departments or maybe for transportation staff in general. So what exactly as PTs should we be doing to support transportation? We know that we should be doing it and we can be doing, but how are we doing that? And so in 2020, APTA produced a fact sheet. We're gonna go over that now. The two links we have here are the pathways to get to the fact to the PDF. We didn't include the link to the PDF so that in the future, if the PDF's updated, you'll be able to get to the updated document, not an outdated version. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen or actually switch over to sharing my screen as um, Tim can go over the fact sheet, okay? So. All right, so. Uh, just so you all know, the, the, what, what brought Sarah and me together was we were part of a working group that put this fact sheet together. It took, took many years to put together, partly because of COVID and, and a bunch of other things. Uh, there were about five or six of us uh, that started off in this process, and we were the last two standing um, by the time it got approved. But um, what the purpose of it was, was really to sit there and tell transportation uh, parents, staff, that what what does a kind of a new PT to the school-based world, what should they know to be able to come in and help support kids in the school setting? So a lot of the beginning of this fact sheet um, talks about what we just talked about um, through all these things, all the different research articles and and kind of what, what transportation is. Um, well, then we got down kind of more to the details of, of how we as a PT support. And it's interesting that, um, so, I'll go through a couple of these bullet points and they're they're pretty obvious. And this kind of, kind of goes along the world of OT as well. Um, but you evaluate students uh, for their ability to physically ask, access transportation. So um, I'm going to get to it a little bit later. But one of the important things is getting on the bus to do these things, um, because as I guess it was in slide 29, we're talking about that eight pages of measurements and everything. Um, it's a different world on the bus, narrower uh, walkways. Uh, narrower seats. So tran uh, if you can transfer inside the school into a chair, it's not the same as transferring onto a bus seat. So those are things that we need to keep in mind. Um, we have to, we help identify the appropriate equipment and we're going to get back into more of that. What WC19 wheelchairs are crash tested, things along those lines. We want to ensure uh, safe vehicle access of uh, using the mechanical lift. Um, hopefully we can get to a case study about that. Um, where do you use steps? Where do you use the mechanical lift? Um, if things are broken, how do we get those taken care of? Um, can we as PTs or OTs be fixing things? Uh, I see what somebody's saying right there about uh, transferring to a bus seat is safer. Completely agree, but that's why we need to get in there and look at it to see if they can even get in that seat in the first place. So um, great point. Um, Ongoing equipment review and monitoring for safety, for transport and securement. So, you know, you see a kid come into school and that's wear and tear on that wheelchair. And we might be the first to see that the brakes are bad or the seatbelt's not working. Um, we assist in identifying temporary backups. Uh, if their equipment's bad, can we help them out get into something? I'm in a large county, um, so I'm very lucky to have access to a lot of donated equipment and other equipment, um, but I suppose in the smaller counties, it's a, it's a different world, or if you're the only PT and you're contracted and you don't have the uh, assets that we do. Um, promoting student independence, uh, we, that's one of the big things. We wanna encourage students to uh, advocate for themselves and do as much as they can by themselves, and that could be um, accessing the stairs or the lift. Um, we won't go through the rest because I think we're kind of running along a little fast, but then there's additional tasks that can be uh, addressed as appropriate. And these are a little bit higher level as you have a more experience. Um, you can help train staff on use of transportation specific equipment, such as tie down systems or lap shoulder belts. And I hear a lot of people out there saying, oh, no way, that's not our world. And I agree 100%, it's not your world. But then once you start to get experience with it, um, 
we'll talk about my role as a liaison can come in and help identify different types of equipment that might keep the kids safer that the bus staff is not necessarily thinking about. Um, uh, I can go down that list, but oop. where the buckle? Yeah, exactly. So we can we can help address those uh, items. Sorry, I just had something pop up in the middle of my screen. Okay, and let's see. Um, we can consult on child safety restraint systems too, and wheelchair tie, tie downs. Um, this goes into if we had a longer period, we uh, had worked with a vendor on our presentation before to talk about how things were um, ordered and what DME providers could get paid for and not paid for. It was all quite interesting, but you know, you learn these things from experience, and that's what it um, comes down to. We had and then finally the key takeaways um, that legally. We must provide transportation transportation to access FAPE. And so what whatever we can do as PTs, OTs, related service to help that student's day get better, this is where it's all coming back together. What, if we can improve their transportation to and from school, we're going to improve their attendance at school. We're going to help their self-esteem. And it's going to be a better overall experience for the kids. And so we can have a voice in that. And we'll talk about that a little bit, little bit later and how to get that voice in there. Sound good? I'm just keeping track of time here. And we're already, yeah. up, to, we're already up to 25 minutes. So. so the one thing I wanted to point out is this document was put out in 2022. Within the document itself, there is a transportation safety checklist that you guys can use. So again, you don't have to create the wheel. It's out there. Um, it deals with individuals or students that are using wheelchairs, students that aren't using wheelchairs. You can take a look at this. It's in the it's in the uh, fact sheet, which we included as a handout. Um, the What I wanted to say specifically is additional resources. We're going to go over more resources today. Some of these links have been changed since this fact sheet was produced. So the resources are on here. The resources we're going to go over now are resources that include these and any updated ones. If anybody has any questions, sometimes they overlap. So I'm going to flip back over to the presentation now um, and just briefly go over with you guys the resources and um, what what you can use them for. Tim, is that, are you yeah, guys seeing sure. everything okay? Okay. So first of all, this was a document that was put out um, when they updated transportation guidelines or the federal regulation guidelines. They had a lot of questions, so much so that um, the Office of Special Education Rehabilitative Services put out a Q&A doc, a, an FAQ doc. So often, this is a place to start. If you're getting the same question over and over again, it may be answered here. It's a really short document and it's a helpful read through because it actually brings up things you may not have thought about previously. These are guidelines for transporting individuals within wheel with wheelchairs. They're all uh, peer reviewed journal articles. And so the... Um, Title of the article is going to give you exactly what's in them. And this is really going to explain in the nitty gritty details why the standards exist, the rationale behind them, why straps should be following, like aligning students in specific locations on the body anatomically. Um, and then that can help you understand and then convey information to transportation staff more accurately. This is, again, more information for transporting students uh, in wheelchairs. I want to quickly pull over to this document, I'm going to switch sharing my screen again. Um, this is the University of Michigan transportation. Sorry, guys. I switched the orientation of my external uh, monitors today, and it's messing with my life. Um, so this is University of Michigan Transportation Rehabilitation Institute. This the website with this information on the fact sheet resources, that was when this UMTRI was involved in a grant. The grant has ended. So that website kind of shut down and they shifted all of these resources to the University of Michigan website. So this is an updated link. This is amazing. It's specifically geared towards students in wheelchairs. You have the Ride Safe brochure. This is going to show you um, really great visuals for any stakeholders on how, like what tie down locations, how students should be tied down. Interestingly, it's available in English and Spanish, also French, also geared towards Australia, if you happen to be Australia. This is the website that's going to go over the voluntary standards. So this is a quick guide to standards. 
It's going to talk you about WC 18, 19, and 20, which are most relevant for our students on the school buses. In order to get these specific word for word standards that come out of ANSI Resna, they're extraordinarily expensive, but this gives you the breakdown of them. What I love about this website is this crash tested products list. If you have a kid that you're working with getting equipment for, come here. If it's a wheelchair, a wheelchair seating system, it's literally a spreadsheet that tells you the manufacturer, the wheelchair name, the components, if it's um, WC19 compliant, et cetera, et cetera. So this is where you can go when you're looking for kids and you're getting equipment with them. Yes, Sarah, I was just going to chime in that we have a lot of parents buying things off of Craigslist or, or those other free free sites. So that's a great one for us to help look for the parent to say you're getting a good chair that can be transported. Um, so these are guidelines for transporting students in general with special needs. This is going to include the Congress document that we just went over, as well as the APA policy statement. These are transporting students with special needs. Again, the Schneider articles are geared towards transportation staff. So it takes all those peer reviewed articles that we went over and it distills it down for people that aren't going to be reading um, peer reviewed journals. People are going to be the transport staff that just need to understand exactly what they need to do. Take the data, bring it down to a realistic message for them. And then this is an example of a state manual that was put out by North Carolina several years ago. This is helpful for bus staff. We felt we wanted to include it because when they're working with students with disabilities, a communication can be huge and this just gives them some tips. And again, it's coming from the Transportation Industries Magazine. Transportation industry resources in general, you have School Bus Fleet Magazine, a lot of great articles that's speaking to transportation staff. School Transportation News, similar, they have a magazine. They also have an annual event, Transporting Students with Disabilities and Special Needs Conference. Multiple PTs have uh, presented at this conference over the years. So it's not out of the realm of possibility if you wanted to attend to see what that was like, what information are they getting. National Association for Pupil Transportation, that is basically a clearinghouse for Con Ed. And you could even get certifications for transporting students with special needs through that, um, not geared towards PTs, geared towards transportation staff. The Pupil Transportation Safety Institute we included because it's primarily based out of New York. It has a lot of continuing education options, but it also has, offers a consultation service nationally. So if you're getting the same issue over and over and over and over again, and you want outside eyes to come in and say, how can, like, what are we doing wrong here? How can we fix this? This could be an option. Sometimes you'll be getting equipment, and Tim will briefly mention this in our case later on, but there, just as there are federal regs for providing PT services in schools, federal regs for transportation for individuals with disabilities, there are federal regulations for transportation, and those are the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards. So these are the ones, so the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards exist in the world, and they're numbered, and they are codified in the regulations or the Code of Federal Regulations in uh, to, uh, section 571 and point whatever number after that is going to correspond to the number of the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards. So if someone's talking to you about the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard number 210, you can go to the CFR and you would just keyword search 571.210. And that's going to give you word for word, seatbelt assembly anchorage, child restraint system, school bus passenger safety seating, crash protection, et cetera. And last but not least, in the fact sheet document, we have that whole section of roles possible for PTs with additional training. A really great place to start is if you wanted to become a nationally certified passenger safety technician. So this is the website where you can do that. It involves courses and a test. So this is all great. We know the school day involves transportation. We know that PTs have a role in transportation. We have some guidelines on what transportation should be doing, how we can support that. But how do you do that in reality? Um, which is a big question that we often get when we're having this discussion with people. So I'm going to hand it over to Tim really quickly. Yeah. So getting back to. to and, and just a moment, yes. uh, Devin oh, had yeah. a question, and I think oh, it's yeah. in follow up to um, the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards. Mm -hmm. um, and he his question was, these apply to public transportation, not personal home van, correct? Correct. OK, just one clarification. Thank you, uh, Devin. I don't actually know. Um, Tim, as you're going over these yeah. slides, I can pull that up and, yeah. and see if we can get an answer. Yeah, absolutely. So um, 
So it's interesting. I I know in different parts of the in different districts, however the the PT OT whatever setup is, um, uh, the role of the li liaison, which I'm going to get to in just a moment, um, is tougher to identify. But so the big thing about what we're we're talking about reframing the day is making the time to get on the bus. You got you got to do that, and whether the how you document that through the IEP that you're going to get on the bus. Um, you need to probably do that so you can uh, get your proper units in and everything so you're covering that service time. But more importantly is if you're thinking, oh, it disappeared, the, the day, the reframing the day um, to accept that there's school day starts and ends when they get on and off that bus um, is so it should be uh, reflected in your evals and everything. Because if they're not being able to get on the bus, or having a tough time transferring to the seat, that needs to be recognized. But it also needs to be recognized that one of the things as a liaison that I've been lucky enough to do is work directly with transportation and being able to tell them the differences between behaviors and physical uh, limitations that they might have. And so what, unfortunately, in our system, we're try still trying to fight for the um, behavioral supports to get onto the buses and to be a bigger part of that day. But that's another story. Um, so we said identify a liaison. So I've been doing this for about 15, 15 years, somewhere around there. And so I'm the point of contact for policies, unique situations and emergencies. And um, it, yes, it is supposed to be uh, part of my job description and also considered into my units. Um, unfortunately, because of staff issues and whatnot, I have a, a rather large caseload, so it's not. So I'm kind of overwhelmed at the moment. But to be able to have that extra time as the liaison um, allows me to go to bat for not only kids, but staff and um, uh, bus staff, school staff, bus staff, and parents. And then the best combination is both. We have individual PTs out there that can handle these bus situations, um, but then I'm their backup, if you will. And oh yes, you added this yesterday, Sarah. Oh, we knew this was probably going to come up because yeah. in our in our county, um, it's funny because on the bus steps, it says no trespassing. And so we have some bus staff that interpret that as nobody will get on my bus. This is my bus. This is we draw the line here. Um, but that's part of their school. And so we need to get on that bus. And so legally, we are allowed to not. Uh, it says in there, is that Oregon? Yeah, so this is the Sorry. OAR. So these are the Oregon's admin rules. And it says that um, bus drivers should not let anybody on the bus uh, unless they are all these people, including school officials. So, I mean, I think that we would be involved as school officials. So if we were permitted on the bus en route, which is what this is saying, I would assume that you would also be allowed to be on the bus, just on the bus. So that's why I wanted to include that here, because they do specifically mention who was allowed on the bus in the transportation yeah. admin rules. Yeah, I apologize um, for that. I just I live in D.C. and I just had a jet fly very low over to my house. Um, so. I'm going to throw I did find in the motor vehicle in the Code of Federal Regulations for the application, it specifically says this standard applies to passenger cars, multipurpose passenger vehicles, trucks and buses. Sorry, Tim, to interrupt. Nope, nope, nope. We'll go to the next slide. All right. There you go. Um, so a big thing about my role as a liaison and also with um, just being a PT out, out there covering schools, um, we want to establish relationships across the board. And so that means you, kind of getting rid of the silos that we find in in the school world with transportation, the schools, us as related services. And so uh, a big part of what I do is uh, building those relationships between the various levels of, of transportation from the bus drivers and uh, attendants to the supervisors to uh, we're lucky enough in our county to have um, equipment specialists uh, that I work. There's two of them that I work directly with. Um, also have documenting that we have clear and concise support to students, families, and staff um, that's in the IEPs, right, in a good present level uh, description, including transportation plans, how a student might get on and off that bus, um, and other communication and training materials. We have to know our audience um, 
can't write something up that's too medically uh, heavy in wording because this has to go to families and uh, bus staff. And so we want it to all be understandable and also to, also to kids. And so the kids, if we're trying to teach them uh, self-advocacy, we want them part of, you know, putting things together of how, how they can get on the bus. Um, we have, again, uh, identifying liaisons. And this takes effort and buy-in, especially from your bosses. Um, I had a lot of support from my bosses because we started having success. Um, and my level of support has uh, dropped significantly as we have given transportation staff the tools to be able to handle things on their own. And and so that's been great. Collaboration, um, I could, I luckily get to some IEPs that are pretty heavy that I get to go be the support as the expert, the liaison expert. Um, you also need to stay within the role of your profession. And this is the tough one because, um, for instance, our State Practice Act for Virginia won't let me help uh, a student transfer out of a wheelchair. It's the occupational therapist that can do that if they're not on my caseload, um, which is kind of hard when I have to go repair breaks or something along those lines so the kid can get home to, home from school for the day. Um, we also have in there our APTA fact sheet. Um, this was something handy that uh, when we interviewed a parent for our annual uh, for a pediatric conference, um, they didn't realize that uh, PT was part of, could be part of the conversation for transportation. And then finally advocating to make legal change. Um, this is where it would be nice to be part of that gold standard talking group because a lot of those people um, that are involved, police and everything, don't know the, the, the details of trans transferring a student from a wheelchair to a bus seat or what it takes to drive a power wheelchair. And we can be advocates for that. And okay. unfortunately, I think we know often change won't happen unless it's legally mandated. So... Okay at the end of the day, it will probably have to see those changes come from the top before it trickles down. Um, so something that will be carried out consistently across the board. Um, so we included these slides towards the end leading into the question and answers because those are topics that we often get from people. So Deb, that is the content piece. If you wanna move into the question and answers, I don't know if people can unmute or they can put it in the chat, whatever works best for you guys. And then we do have two case studies. So if we have about 25 minutes left, maybe we could do 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A, kind of see how it goes. Right, let's see how it goes. Uh, you know, I, all I can say is, wow, you have pulled together such wonderful information for this presentation, things, and you included what's happening or should be happening across Oregon. Um, we have uh, here, I think we probably told you before that as a group um, pulled together uh, some uh, documents that were known as the PEEP, the Personal Emergency Evacuation Plan. And so we've got a template for that. But we've also been working for the state school emergency folks who have a grant uh, or it was a grant, it was a five-year grant to work with communities and bringing all the people to the table who um, are responsible or should be through to, uh, to develop plans in schools. And so we worked alongside them. It's no longer a grant program. It is now part of uh, ongoing funding. Uh, but some of these conversations or the information that you're having here is crucial to the training that people should be good at getting and, and the voices that should be at the table. And I think we know, as you said, that therapists, though it seems to fall to them to know exactly what to do for a student, they are so often not at the table. And I just want to say that I will be sharing this information with Alex and his team. Uh, they've been wonderful partners, but just bringing these perspectives and all the things that you have brought together, we will also be sharing it with Brock. Um, and uh, I will probably mispronounce his last name. I think it's Dittus, but he's been part of our conversations and trying to help us to learn what um, the bus drivers do know and what is required training here. And you've incl included slides uh, about that as well, some of the information uh, we've been hoping to get. So 
uh, opening, just giving you some of that big picture stuff, all of what you have said fits in. So I really see this as a video or a session uh, that will um, be shared broadly. And so want to ask, and uh, with all of this information, it's kind of overwhelming for me as a non-therapist, but all of you are probably shaking your heads yes and saying, yes, this is what we need. I don't want to assume that. Please feel free to type in the chat box uh, or to unmute yourself or both uh, to share your feedback. Uh, what is it that you see that we need to make this happen? I think greater awareness is the first step. So we're on a road to that. And I think one thing that Tim and I see is we're still in this world of black and white, white, either PT isn't involved in all, or we do advocate for ourselves and we say, hey, we should be involved. And they're like, great, you do it all. So we wanted to give you guys resources to say, to advocate to be a part of the conversation, not the person that's responsible for all of it, because we, we have a scope of practice and we have to stay within that. But when you are able to clearly demonstrate what you can bring to the table, then we also wanted to give you resources to help you bring that information to the table because this isn't something we learned in PT school. Um, so we wanted to do both. We wanted to give you resources to be able to advocate for what you can and what is not appropriate for us to be doing. And then when you are finally at a place where you can support, how can you do that? And I think that the point that you made about collaboration um, with other folks is really what we're trying to say too. We found the most successes in being able to uh, bring everybody to a town hall so we can have these conversations. And, and the PTs, that's where it first popped up in our learning team is that PTs overwhelmingly uh, were doing this in a silo. So um, couldn't agree more. Yeah, I was going to mention that one nice thing that's come out of my defined liaison role is that we meet either once or twice a year with a working group of transportation staff, uh, including the, the director of transportation. He's there uh, and uh, with several other players. And it's just been so nice to sit down and talk with each other face to face and uh, discuss what what were the most common themes we saw that were. Uh, needed addressing. Um, also, uh, they've entrusted me since we've built the relationship that I'm actually going to our due process people to discuss several legal matters in the county um, because I'm going to bat for bus staff uh, to try to help them out. And um, they trust me to do that uh, because we've been working well together and they know that I have their best interest in mind and, and a unique perspective. So um, again, and we that know building that these, relationships. When, whenever we have our therapists, of course, and they're working directly with a student, they're doing a lot of these things and yeah. they're doing it. And sometimes it's the hard way because they don't know what others can bring to the table or what is in their training and their expertise that can uh, help them these to be better uh, decisions. So uh, Kathy, um, you can all see what she's typed there. Uh, provide a brief example of how the transportation equipment might be documented. Yeah, um, I don't know what the IEP format looks like for Oregon, but um, in Pennsylvania, you know, we have a section where um, it's anything that would need to support specially designed instruction. And within that, I would put, you know, if, if a toilet, if a student uses an adoptive toilet seat for them to access the bathroom at school, I would put it in that section. And so likewise, if there's a piece of equipment that would be needed for the student, I would include it there as well. I would include it there in addition to whatever transportation plan exists. And that should be a template and it should include the, the um, equipment that the student's using for transportation. So if you had a student that was using a five point harness for whatever reason, either small size um, it would be included in the transportation plan. So if you have a student that would need to utilize a piece of equipment for transportation, that's more DME as opposed to a piece of transportation equipment, I would include it in both places, both in whatever, wherever you're detailing equipment needed in the IEP itself, as well as specifically in the transportation plan, which should also be included in the IEP. 
Tim, how do you guys do it? Mm -hmm. No, much, much the same way what you're saying. We we tried to uh, not write. So you might write a five point harness. You don't put any specific uh, name brands on anything. Um, we'll describe that. And then uh, we might put in parentheses currently using, you know, X, Y or Z specific brand uh, in there. But yes, it's in the present level page. And oftentimes it makes it into the accommodations page under uh, specialized furniture equipment. And then also in what we call C-STARS. Um, is that's their uh, transportation plan and um yeah so you just it just got to cover all your bases so and we know so that hard. across oregon there's lots of different best practices in in different districts mm -hmm. so if anybody else has a different way or or would like to say uh, based on what you do in our iep system feel free to uh to share that but what you said makes perfect sense on a big picture level There's something else I was going to mention, Sarah. Now you have a quizzical look in your eye. I can see it. I was uh, just no. There, there was something. There was something to do that we talked of. Oh, it had to do with the evacuation plans. I know you had mentioned uh, to, to talk about evacuation plans, and we can be a great support in an evacuation plan. But um, transportation in our world is they're the ones making the plan. But I do think it's extremely important that we uh, be able to be a resource to them to say, okay, your plan involves this. You're going to use a blanket to get the student out of the, the um, bus. That's great. But do you realize they can break their bones extremely easy? So yes, you'd rather have a student break some bones than die in fire on, on a bus. But if they're, say, in a conveyed stroller, we can show them how to uh, lower that, how to use body mechanics and everything to get that stroller out without having to remove the student from the uh, seating or whatever. So we can be part of all of that. But um, I know that people have said that we PT should be writing evacuation plans, and, and I disagree, because that's, that's the transportation's role. We are, again, just a support or resource. Is that happening here in Oregon, PTs? Are you writing emergency plans? Or being asked to. Being yeah. asked to, yes. I kind of feel the answer is yes to that. So it's nice to know, but please correct me if I'm wrong. So since there's no words going on there, we're also talking about advocating uh, for kind of policy changes and. We're running into an issue right now in our county uh, with uh, restraint and seclusion issues. And so one of the things that has come up is that uh, to lift a student up is considered a restraint at times. And so uh, we're having to, I have to meet with due process to discuss the fact that some students need to be lifted into the bus seat or need to be lifted onto a changing table. And this is not a restraint. So to be part of that discussion too is, is, is quite helpful. And uh, it's nice to have a seat at the table. It's really what it comes down to. Um, just specific, to specifically show you guys, this is the um, National School Transportation Specifications and Procedures. This is the, I think it's pulled up, um, the Emergency Evacuation of Students with Disabilities. There are two paragraphs here. Um, no, this is the section. There's more information in the appendices that we had shared with you guys, but it says... It is important to enlist the help of school liaisons, parents, and other personnel, e.g. physical therapists, to train and help students and staff understand emergency procedures, including how to exit the bus without use of their mobility device and equipment, okay? Local emergency personnel should be involved in developing the plans. So that is coming from the transportation world, right? These are the guidelines they're putting out as suggestions for states to use them when they're adopting their own legally mandated guidelines. It doesn't say PTs write these plans. It says that we are enlisted to help. Um, and so if you are being asked to do that, this is a document you can you can bring to the table and say, you know what, I'm, this isn't, A, it's not in my practice act. B, I don't feel comfortable doing this. C, it looks like we should be doing this as a team and also involving emergency local emergency personnel. And when we look at the student as a whole, we know, uh, of course, the PT and positioning, et cetera, 
I don't mean to minimize any of that, but also to say that uh, if we're looking at behaviors and strategies, our OT certainly are, are ones who can help with the sensory pieces in, in, in everyday training or everyday transportation and emergencies. Those are, can be crucial uh, to helping a person cope uh, with the havoc that's going on around them. So again, everybody's got a role in a con piece of this conversation. It's um, it's true. There is part of the one article that um, went into listing ways that transportation can access other school services, one of which is, you know, a positive implementation of um, behavioral support plans. And if we have staff that are working OTs or even, you know, our speech language colleagues that are working with our students, they can be working with them on the bus, too. They don't stop communicating when they leave the school building, you know, and I um and I think that transportation is a huge access point for all of us, all of us related service providers. Um, but Catherine had a question about, is there guidance on what to do in a student's transportation wheelchair is under repair and not usable for a short amount of time? Are we required to provide a device for them if they are unable to ride in the bus seat? So I have my answer, Tim. Do you want to start? Um, I was going to say actual guidance. I don't believe there's guidance at all on, on that. Um, I can never, I, I can't see there ever being guidance uh, directed to that because that's putting a huge burden on the district or the school. Um, again, I'm in a large county, and so we've been lucky enough to have many donations of conveyed and other uh, WC19 uh, uh, strollers, wheelchairs. And so we keep a whole stash of them and we'll loan those out or other wheelchairs. Uh, we've used Medicaid funds to buy those because it's been a need that we, we have a, uh, a lot of uh, families that don't have the resources to even get a chair to start. So in that process, we want them in school. And so we are helping to provide those or worked on ways to uh, with social workers to get equipment for kids to get to school. Uh, again, we're blessed with a, a larger county, so. And I would say, as it often does, it will come down to what's written in the IEP. So if if in the IEP includes that the student's using a wheelchair to access their educational program, transportation is part of their educational program. So they need to have one to access it. And so I think you would be on the hook for providing it. Um, I think it's never a bad idea. Just if, if you have the space for it to keep those uh, wheelchairs that students outgrow or if you have some funding getting a couple of backup wheelchairs um then you're looking at what are those backup wheelchairs so you don't want you know a little transport wheelchair often conveyed strollers are nice because they can get the transport option if they don't have a transport option there are safe places for them to be tied down to be secure for transport and i think another question to look at is why are students um unable to safely ride in a bus seat you know is it postural support and are there other it, it, depending upon how student specific that postural support is um you know there may be a harness that can help them stay upright or is it physical postural support um due to you know anatomical alignment and whatnot then if there if it's not possible for them to use a wheelchair that isn't um, specifically design, designed for them, then that's a conversation you have. It, I mean, it may be appropriate to have an IEP amendment to say, you know, depending upon how long that wheelchair is going to be out, because there's a difference between a student who has, you know, like a body molded seat versus a student who has a pretty straightforward flat seat, flat back that can easily move into another wheelchair. Um, but I think if you're having these conversations about transportation for, from day one, when issues like this pop up, people's heads don't explode. You already have these lines of communication open with transportation, with the family, and then you can have, I think people get less defensive right off of the bat and you can more quickly move to a solution that's going to be appropriate for everybody, if that makes sense. Absolutely. I said Devin had a question in there. He said, not transportation, not specific plan, but have been asked to weigh in on how students load and unload, unload or drive onto the lift. Um, interestingly enough, that's one of our case studies. Um, 
and I think we're kind of running oh, yeah. out of and we time can, to go over the case. Yeah. Here, but we, we could go over kind of what happened with that. Or what do you think, Deb? I mean, I don't know what our time frame is right now. Well, we've got about, about 11 minutes. minutes. 11, 11 um, minutes. And I know some people can stay on, but most people won't. Right. Well, um, if you, you can do some abbreviated conversation, the case study and applying it to a student okay. really cements mm -hmm. some of the understanding. So let's okay. go ahead and go there. Let's look at Curtis real quick. Okay, I'll pull up Curtis. And while I'm doing that, um, I was going to ask er or address Erica Johnson's question about the liability. So if we are providing, um, well, in previous districts, if we were providing a piece of loaner equipment, the families had to sign off to, to say, to basically release the school of liability before we could loan to them. Because these are the options that we have for them. But it's them using that equipment with the understanding that they can't then turn around and sue the school. If that makes sense, Tim, what do you guys do for yeah. your. We have we have a loaner form that we have them sign off, check off that they've seen all the equipment, all the safety features, how to fold, unfold, do all those type of things. So mm -hmm. um, uh, that's another one of our questions for due process, because I think that probably means nothing in the long run. Uh, but then again, we just need to see what that is. But our concern is we were having students. Uh, were uh, looking for comp time. Our family's looking for comp time when their equipment didn't work and we couldn't get them to school. Um, so it was we it's been uh, wonderful to get kids in school. It, this all started with a kid having broken brakes and he missed three weeks of school because the parents couldn't afford to get the brakes fixed. Um, so that kind of started this whole thing years and years ago of trying to support this families. So Curtis, we'll go through Curtis real quick. He's got a a congenital muscular dystrophy, a very rare condition. Um, he's progressive. Uh, he's got limited volitional strength and range of motion throughout his body. He dry, he's got micro fractures. He um, wears SMOs bilaterally and has a PHTA with him throughout the school day, which is he's the PHTA is not on the bus, a public health training assistant. So basically personal care assistant and uh, much time, stuff like that. Um, he independently drives his power wheelchair for all mobility throughout the school day and negotiates Pearson obstacles safely. In the classroom, he requires uh, adult or peer assistance to set up. Um, he requires adult support to retrieve items through the lunch line to open items to set up his uh, lunch. Uh, for, and he also, for reposition his wheelchair, needs assistance. He is not transferred at school by staff during the school day due to student preference. He's actually voiced this, that he um, only likes when his parents um, transfer him in and out he just gets too nervous um so that is yeah that's another story um and he will ask for help repositioning in the wheelchair if as needed on the bus he uh uses the lift to to board and exit the bus he faces um outward on the lift so like like any other kid he's usually backing onto the bus lift and going out and he reports that he's uneasy when he is lifted from the ground as the Lift will tilt forward and he experiences a fear, uh, feeling of falling. And this does not occur when he is exiting the bus and being lowered to the ground, although he is still facing the same direction. Okay, so that was kind of our case study. And we'll go through this. We won't, Here, won't worry on. about a big discussion on it. Hold on. I wanted to. Um... Here. So, so can you scroll up a little higher? Yeah, yeah. there you go. So you can see when uh, this is not Curtis, but this is another young man who we were having the discussion on whether or not we would allow kids to drive on and off the bus lift and best practices to turn off the motors, pull them back on and do that. But the crown of the road and the weight of the chair often has it lean forward. So that's not me exaggerating. That's me on the bus. That's not me exaggerating with the camera how far he's tilted forward. But between that student and the wheelchair, he was weighing up at 500 pounds about uh, with all the stuff on the chair. So Curtis, when he would lean forward, would have that feeling of falling forward. Um, and we had broken this out so we could talk through strengths and weaknesses, but for the sake of time, um, that present level talked a lot about what he was doing in school. So how do how can that be translated or what would you expect to see as far as strength and needs on the bus? Yeah. So, he, so yeah, you got all the driving. He's he's a very skilled driver and he's a great advocate for his needs. And he advocated for the fact that he didn't want to get out of his chair during the day for personal care. Um, 
and the needs is the feeling uneasy, which is something, how can you quantify that? Okay. So we were talking about what kind of transportation related goals we could have for Curtis. Well, he doesn't have any, there's no need. He can drive just fine. He can get on and off the lift himself. Um, and, uh, but he gets uncomfortable and scary, uh, scared feeling. So this is where the collaboration with transportation came into play. I, we'll look at that next slide too. Oh, this is what followed up from this. So I went out there with one of the equipment specialists, the bus supervisor and a couple other people, and we watched the process. And, uh, and so luckily Curtis was able to tell us what was going on. So when the bus lifted off the ground, the, the side of the lift that's closest to the bus lifts several inches off the ground first, thus making it tilt forward before it lifts up. And so that motion terrified Curtis, okay? So um, he was hoping to face forward towards the bus to not have that feeling. Well, you always hear you got to face away from the bus when you're lifting, but there's no, there's no information anywhere out there on the bus lift manufacturer, the, the wheelchair sites or anything like that that says um, you have to face away from the bus. The reason is oftentimes is that the kid's feet or whoever's feet will get stuck under the foot plate, the, the kick plate of the uh, lift in the bus itself. So if you, if you turn his chair around, he would get stuck under this. Um, why am I pointing at it? You can't see what I'm pointing at. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyways, so this, that's a different letter right there. This it is, should be. This is the one we want. No, not that one. This okay. is a C. This yeah, one. Yeah. So what it came down to is that luckily I was able to write in there that that Curtis has 90 degree foot plates, uh, uh, foot rests that drop down and he does, his feet will not get stuck underneath. He's got, because of the size of his wheelchair, it's narrower. The lift is strong enough that it can lift his uh, chair up with the weight being a little bit further out on the lift. Um, so we wrote all this up and uh, the observations and then luckily, knowing that there were some federal guidelines, we could go in there and then the ADA says, the lift shall permit both inward and outward facing of wheelchair and mobility aid users. So this was my uh, in, if you will, to support, um, I was gonna call him by his real name, Curtis, with um, what he was asking for. Um, and then as we went through this, we wrote all this up, uh, and it's conclusions yep. and considerations. And it was signed by me and somebody from transportation. Should I read that one out there? Oh, I said that again. I mean, you it, can. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah. Yeah, it's the same thing. Okay. But um, if the lifting manufacturer specifies the wheelchair must face away from the vehicle when using the lift, the transportation operators require permit passengers to board face the vehicle. Okay, that was our question. Um, so what was great about this thing is that uh, Curtis advocated for himself. The, because of the relationship we had built over the years, we weren't just told, no, he has to face the bus by transportation. We got in there together, looked at him together, um, found some uh, legal supports for this. And then ultimately we went into the family and said, you know what, this is great for now, but this is going to, this likely could change if he gets bigger and we need to get a bigger wheelchair and it, the, the footprint doesn't work. Uh, you know, we'll have to keep that in mind. And so, the family, this was the same family that said, I didn't realize PT could be part of this process. Um, we kind of all came together and made a decision that worked for everybody. And and it, the, the family actually said that they had not felt that supported by the school system um, with some of the students' needs uh, in a very long time. So good things to go. I mean, good things came from all that. And Tim, I have a question. <clears throat> this was, <clears throat> sorry guys. <clears throat> this was your your specific student at the time so he was not on my caseload no oh, okay. so this so is that, this so is where i came in transportation liaison yeah because it was a, okay. a unique situation okay that was so my question the pt had reached out to me to say hey they want to do this what can we do so so the pt the pt who covered that school was actually also part of this process but i went in as the liaison the the expert uh to help out. So when we're talking about doc appropriately documenting the time you're spending with your kids in the IEP, 
this is a this is a one time thing, right? You yeah. can't hold an IEP meeting to add in two hours of this one service delivery, right? So this is a great opportunity for the liaison to come in. So it's in there. It doesn't need to be because it's a once and done thing. You can't account for that just out of the blue popping up. But if you have a kid that every single year at the start of the year, you know, you're going to have to be retraining the bus staff, the bus monitor. That is something that you could include in the IEP. Maybe it is just a one or two time visit, but it's every single year. September or October that you know you're going to be going in and spending that time for that student. That is something you could include in the IEP to to justify your time that you're going to be spending there. Yep. So that's where the combo model of being able to identify individual needs that are going to be recurring that you can build into the IEP versus these emergencies or these out of the blue one time things that maybe a transportation liaison or a lead PT could cover. Absolutely. Sorry, I was I got I read something. There was something from so it was Devin, right, that had written about the driving on and off the lift. So a lot of that comes down to the PT. So this doesn't answer your specific question. This was just a unique situation that it worked that a student could do it different than the norm. But um, yeah, we have kids driving on, on and off the lift all the time because we're going to we've had too many staff get injured by pulling uh, those heavy wheelchairs on and off and we've been trying to advocate for different ways of getting that lift i mean uh, getting that chair on and off and um, i think i had another picture on there i think it was a fo the forward facing on the google drive thing uh, mm -hmm. i can try the pictures yeah but um yeah it's going to bat for the bus staff they really do appreciate that you know when we're saying hey it's too hard for this staff member to lean over and um get that chair on. 